if I didn't play music, I, I don't I don't think I'd still be here. So you wouldn't have been working on getting that, you know, developer job. <laughs> yeah, I would have been I would have I would have just fallen off the edge. If you've wanted yet feared to do work that is weird, this is the show you just need to hear. You've heard Lenny Pickett's saxophone before. Maybe it was on an Elton John record, or Katy Perry, or Meatloaf, or Mariah Carey, or Paul McCartney. Or maybe it was his own group, Tower of Power. The list goes on. Seriously, it's basically endless. But where you've definitely heard that trademark tenor sax of his is during the opening credits of Saturday Night Live. You can see him sitting there, with the rest of the band on stage during the opening monologues. His trademark curly gray-white hair is a dead giveaway. Today, Lenny tells me about being a high school dropout, what it's like playing alongside the biggest legends in music, and what it actually means to be the band leader at SNL. I'm your host, Sam Balter, and this is Weird Work. Now let's listen to them speak about their jobs, which are quite unique. Weird Work. How did you find your way into joining SNL back in 1985? Paul Notes was doing a concert. He needed a horn section, and he needed uh, me to help him, and did the concert. Uh, it was a live show at the Apollo Theater, and it became an HBO special for Holland Oates and a, an album with Eddie Kendricks and David Ruffin from The Temptations. The guitar player was G.E. Smith, who had earlier been married to Gilda Radner, and uh, about a year after that concert, he uh, got asked to be the band leader for Saturday Night Live and remembered me from the gigs I did with Holland Oates and asked me to come an audition and I auditioned and got the job. Why like why do you think the saxophone is such a perfect instrument for the show? It's sort of a self uh defining situation. Uh it was Lauren's original idea about what the sound should be like. So it, it you know it's it was born with that sound. So of course you assume that it's the right sound. You, you know when someone is born and you give them a name um, you know, go around questioning it for the rest of your life. Um, it was it was a signature. I think you know there's there was a lot of conversation between Howard and Lauren in the beginning of the when they first put the show together about what would be right and the kind of band that they wanted. I think it was sort of slightly modeled on a band, sort of like you know Robbie Robertson's band, but with horns, like a sort of gospel tinged R and B sound with a horn section. Uh, they didn't want like a big band like The Tonight Show because that was sort of old fashioned. So they're looking for something so, sort of simultaneously classic and new for television. So one thing that I'm wondering about is like it being a live show, you have all the dangers of things going wrong, mm -hmm. you know, at any given moment. Did you ever feel that kind of pressure when you were first starting out and first joined the band? They're like, oh, if I mess up, like I'm going to be messing up in front of millions of people yeah you yeah i started out with that um <laughs> but you're you know, you're way past that now there's several different ways to approach it um you can think about it like you know there's eight million people but you can also think about it there's you know 250 people in this room here listening to what we're doing let's entertain them and <laughs> um and and approach it that way you're, you're better off ignoring the camera as much as possible and ignoring the um, and, and just playing to the room. If you just think about the fact that you're being photographed doing a live performance and you approach it with the natural way that you would pursue a, night, a live performance, then I think you're in good shape. And performing for 250 people is not too scary. Most of what we do doesn't get on camera because we, we perform for the, the audience for all the commercial breaks. There are, let's see, nine, 10 commercial breaks. And so we play maybe 20 minutes of performing to an audience in the room that that is that's not broadcast because the the broadcast is sending out a commercial what kind do you what kind of music do you play in between um i write most of it the band members write a little bit of it as well um the songs are original but you'd recognize them as being genre pieces for the most part it seems like the opening monologue is you know one of the biggest parts of the show it's like people like review the opening monologues. They're, they're such a staple to it. Um, it seems like 
there's been just more and more singing and musical numbers in the opening monologues over the last few years? Well, it comes and goes. There's, there's not been that many this season, but there were there were quite a few last season. You know, yeah. it's, to watch The Rock sing is a fantastic thing. You know, it's like, it's, <laughs> you know, and it turns out he can. So it's like, which is great. great. It's kind of great. And Lauren loves to have music in the show. Uh, he, he likes to brighten the show up with music. Music's always an enhancement. And it tends to be that the writers, when they get tired, um, I noticed this, there's more musical numbers submitted. <laughs> Whether the more musical numbers are included is another story. But we have to field all the music that might be there and, and have it ready to present for the read-through, which has become sort of like a, a private radio show that we do with the sound effects and music and all that sort of stuff. And when I started as music director, uh, Cheryl um, uh, Hardwick was, was my co-music director and she just banged everything out on an upright piano and, and occasionally bring a boom box into the room. But now we have like a sound system. That was and, your, that was your original read through tech was a piano yeah. and a boom box. Yeah. <laughs> and so now you now you've no upgraded to like a crew of people working now on it. It's a crew with a, with mics in the ceiling to catch the actors' voices and and speakers in the ceilings and and you know it's it's a big production. Do you actually just just curious, do you miss like it sounded like things used to be a little more shoestringy? Uh do you miss I, that or, <laughs> or do you I, like I, Yeah, I'm kind of old school, you know. Yeah. I, I would um I would. I, I was happy with the piano. <laughs> <laughs> you were good. You were good with piano boom box as the read. Through. Yeah, it was fine. It was fine with me. I, you know, occasionally I'd bring my saxophone in and you know uh, play a little something. Um, but you know, but it's become more of a of a production. So that's what it is. Um, uh, world changes. You know, technology shifted too. These things would have been barely possible before. You know, brilliant. You know, programs uh, on people's laptops were impossible i mean and and we've survived because we've adapted to changes in technology i i was you know i pushed a lot for computer music you know technology early on i have a you know a long enthusiasm for that that predates my time with the show and i i, I thought it would be helpful and so to some extent the the move that direction is my fault but but it was inevitable it was going to go that way anyhow that's just what happened to the music industry so even though you're like an old school like you're fine with the upright piano and the boo box occasionally a sax vote you were you were jumping on the the tech seeing was, the writing I, on the wall there i it was it was there was no getting around it and there yeah. was you know my my son got his music his uh, music degree in uh, music technology at cal arts and he was really helpful with me um sort of bringing me up to speed i part of part of it makes sense because we're we're a parody show and making parody of of contemporary things requires that you have contemporary technology working yeah you uh, can't you can't really make fun of or make a parody of like the most recent hip-hop album or pop music if you're not using something electronic exactly like exactly. it's yeah it just wouldn't even be possible uh I, I, even even background music on television is made you know the, you know nobody has the budgets anymore to go with live orchestras or very few people do and and but but so you know even if we're making a, a parody of a tv show and we're doing background music for it we're going to make it the way that they make the music on those shows we're sort of we serve a, a, a number of functions you know we we, we provide like a uh, distraction, you know, while the audience, because they don't broadcast, they don't air the commercials in the studio, you know, audience isn't watching commercials, they're watching a black screen. And their focus tends to go towards us or towards the movement that's going on in the studio. Because between sketches, the crew moves all this equipment around. They have to move from one side of the studio to the other. There's scenery that has to be built and, you know, sort of reset up. Oh, that's so funny. So you're like partially there as like, let's just take a break from the comedy. Let's keep mm -hmm. the energy in the room up. But then you're exactly. also there as a slight distraction from like, as we move around all these sets, cameras, undo C clamps and like move, you know, set up new right. silly, ridiculous sketches. We're sort of combination distraction and entertainment and, and rodeo clown, you know, <laughs> So we've we've talked a little bit about kind of like what the band at Saturday Night Live does. Like you are there for the intro. You're there in between during the commercial breaks to keep up the audience, to be that uh, rodeo clown distraction. Mm -hmm. But what I'm wondering is like being 
the band leader for SNL? Like, what are your responsibilities? Well, um, I'm responsible for personnel. I'm responsible for repertoire, and um, I'm responsible for organizing the all the different events, like the the rehearsal schedule before the season starts the rehearsals uh, that we do on Saturdays, uh, the rehearsals that take place on Thursday and Friday, if there's sketch music that needs to be rehearsed, we use like a skeleton crew to come in and do that. And I'm responsible for looking over that. You know, my job goes beyond just band leader. I, I, I'm, I work upstairs in the office, um, you know, mostly, you know, clerical and, and uh, administrative tasks. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of interface with a legal department around copyright issues and things like that. And, oh, like what music you well, can use or like this music yeah, sounds music too much like this it. music. Exactly. exactly. Oh, okay. So you found something that you love, but you can't use it, but you just want to get the feel of it and, and how, how far can, how close can you get to the original? How far away do you have to stay from it? You know, all those sort of things. And. So one of the things I'm curious about is you mentioned uh, personnel being a big part of your mm -hmm. uh, your job. So that's like bringing new people into the band and, you know, potentially letting people go from the band. Right. I'm wondering, what, what do you look for in somebody who's going to be part of the SNL band? Well, you know, I'm, uh, we're, we're getting old. Um, I'm 63. My, my oldest band member is 72. And there's... A few of us that are approaching that age and so i'd like younger people you want the replacements to be people that are going to last for a while you know that's one thing i look out for is you know very capable young people yeah i'm looking for people with extreme flexibility you know that where they can play you know 20 different styles without you know hesitating uh i look for someone who can sight read music really really well because we don't have time to stop and learn the music by by you know orally we have to we have to pick it up off the page really quickly hmm. but i'm looking for improvisers people who can who are fast on their feet and can make you know changes at the last minute if they have to they spend you know a couple of hours with each applicant i auditioned 40 keyboard players the last time we needed a keyboard player and spent a couple oh hours. my god okay and so are you are you just like sight read this look at I this put a bunch play. Of music in front of them I, we sit down we we play together we talk i see what kind of you know, energy they have, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, they have to also make a very, very long hang for the day of, for Saturday. <laughs> I want to know that we're, you know, going to be compatible and that personalities are going to match up and all that. Um, it's, it's, it's a family. So you're inviting someone to join something. I mean, the most recent player joined, I don't know, like eight or 10 years ago. Damn. So there's not a lot of turnover. You guys are locked in no, for no, years. We're, 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 you know, uh, we're there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> People don't, don't tend to leave. Uh, Dr. Luke left, um, but, you know, he had other horizons to, you know, to pursue. He was, he had turned into like one of the biggest pop producers. Um, he was 21 when he joined the band and he left when he was 31, I guess. Um, Do you look for a focus on maybe degrees like, you know, uh, do they go to Berkeley? Do yeah. they go to, you know, NYU or something like that? Big music schools. It turns out that several of the people have, but I didn't go to high school. I didn't, I didn't finish the ninth grade. Oh, um, really? Yeah. So I'm not. So you um, don't care really that much. Well, I, you know, I grew up, I, I'm a child of the sixties. You know, I, I, you know, my, you know, listening experience was, you know, Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and, and Led Zeppelin and all that sort of thing, along with John Coltrane and and Ornick Coleman and Sonny Rollins. I, I I you know I had the full on experience of a kid. I grew up in Berkeley, California, which had a, a very um, comprehensive jazz festival each year. And and my stepfather was a jazz musician, but I also had all my friends and what what they listened to. I listened to James Brown and Sly Stone was a local DJ in in the Bay Area when I was growing up. So. You were in like uh, the hottest spot for music growing yeah, up. Yeah, it was amazing. I, I played with John Lee Hooker. I played with, um, you know, Santana. I played with, you know, like all sorts of different. Yeah, I, I I looked at your your Wikipedia. Your list of people you've played with and albums you've been on is, it's getting uncomprehendably large. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Part of that's just being a studio musician and 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 what what comes along, but but some of it was you know also 
being in, in a certain locale at a certain time. And, and I grew up in the moment of music where, where it was exploding. <laughs> you, know, it was, you know, the industry was exploding and it was happening right in my town. Um, in San Francisco was like all the record labels moved offices there because there was something going on there. And I went to the park every, every weekend and listened to bands for free and, and was, no, I, I have a ecumenical um, appreciation of music. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a jazz musician. I don't think of myself as a jazz musician. I, I play jazz, but that's, I don't describe myself that way. Um, How would you describe yourself then? I specialize on tenor saxophone, um, you know, but I play, you know, 30 other instruments. And um, I have a very long standing interest in electronic music. SNL as a whole has arguably the biggest celebrities uh, of our time, of any year, appear on SNL. Some of the biggest, like, musical acts uh, of our time are every year are appearing on SNL. And you are front and center for that right is there anybody that sticks out in your mind like from your whole experience like your top performances that you were like that was fucking incredible that was amazing there was a great performance by prince oh my god really it had to do with fire there was like a big there was like fire effect on stage and he played the most genius guitar solo i'd heard in a long time and and the great thing about it was that he I, I i go to the um sound balance on thursday and then to the camera blockings on thursday and then to the i often will you know go watch especially if i like the act uh, another sound balance on saturday and then there's a dress rehearsal and then there's an air show so i i see the you know consecutive performances and, and his guitar solo just kept getting better and better it was it was awe-inspiring in its in the beginning and it just it just ramped up so wait you get to see the performance up to three times oh more than that more than that i i, I usually you know at least per, see it peripherally at least five or six times wow it's okay so you got to see prince which has got to be hands out amazing who else stood out in your mind as like an incredible an incredible act i, I look at it from a musician standpoint in a performer and in my own performances, I'm looking for like a transcendent moment. You know, I'm looking for a place where the audience and the and the performer sort of converge. And you know, that's the those are rare. Those are rare things. You you can be impressed by an artist, but to feel communion with an artist is something entirely different. And and that's my criteria. So I'm I'm a pretty tough customer. I'm I'm watching it for musicality. I thought I think Alabama Shakes is really good. Um, I, I Aretha delivered a couple of great performances on the show. Aretha uh, Franklin. Franklin. Uh, we we played with Al Green a few times, and I think he was always fantastic. You know, I've done 640 shows uh, without missing one. Um, so that's you've, 600. You've never missed the performance. I've never missed a performance. So there's that's that's 640, you know, live music acts doing two songs. That's you know, um, 1300 almost, you know, performances. It's it's hard to keep track of all of that. Oh um, my god, that's so many. Like, you saw performances <laughs> that people would like kill to go see. You know what I mean? Like, like all your list is like your starting list of like you know, the ones that you've probably forgotten at this point are ones that other people would like give an arm to go check out. Right. So, I mean, seeing all of these different acts over the years, has it impacted your own work in any ways? Has it changed the way you think about uh, producing and, and making music? I, I started out very, very young. I, my first professional gig, I was 14. And, and I, I pretty much knew what I wanted to do a very, very long time ago. Um, I'm not shopping for, you know, new ways of dealing with my, my own music. And my own music is very strange and eclectic. And it's not... What would you say your own music is predominantly? Jazz or... Mm. Well, I have a new record that, that I just finished and I just got the copies delivered for that's uh, vinyl, vinyl only. I didn't, there's no digital on it at all. Um, it's a piece that I, that I worked on in, in the mid 80s 
uh, for a choreographer. It's it's 72 tracks of wind instruments that I played myself and 16 tracks of percussion. And no streaming on this one. No. No CDs. No. This is only vinyl. Vinyl, yeah. And I just printed up a thousand copies and that's it. Um, Whoa. I feel like music has been somewhat devalued by its easy accessibility and we used to take home a record and listen to it with our friends. Yeah. And, and that was an activity. Now, you, you know, people put earbuds in and listen to music privately and it doesn't have the sort of communal activity that it used to have, except for in concert settings and people, you know, stream, you know, their concerts and, and they're sort of ubiquitous. And it, I think it's devalued the, the experience a little bit. So my interest is to try to keep it like a, a unique opportunity. You know, when, when Stravinsky was young, his parents sent him to see an opera, I think, in Moscow, and it was, you know, several days ride by horse uh, and buggy, and he got there and listened to the one performance and then came back, you know. Imagine how much things have changed since the 19th century. So you're you're more pushing back towards that, where, like, you got to go out of your way to get one of these 1,000 printed <laughs> records. Exactly, <laughs> and, and, and enjoy the experience of it. Um, wow, man, it's, it's so funny to me, though, because, like, you seem like such a, like a curious dude on like, oh, what's this new technology? How are they making well, this music? I've experimented with all that. And I, yeah. I, use, the, I use the technology in, in creating the work. And then distribution, um, you're like, I'd rather just keep this thing to a thousand vinyl records. Yes. Um, <laughs> because I, I, I think that uh, you want to use the technology where it's best used and take from it what you find most valuable. And, and I find that that the ubiquity of music has actually made people less interested in it. How many people speed listen through their albums, you know? Well, even people listening to albums, that's yeah, like, I, like albums. I listen to albums, like I stream them, but I listen to the full album. And that almost seems conversationally weird. Cause I'll talk to people about like, Oh, I liked maybe two or three songs, but the album as a whole was okay. Or, you know, and like, that's not really a common no. conversation. It's not, but, but, you know, you would get like, um, I remember like when talking book came out and I called, you know, I got a copy and I called up like, you know, four of my friends, you want to come over and hear it. And we put the record on and listened. And, and at the end of the first side, the, you know, the needle sort of sitting in the run out track, you know, and you say, Hey, I think we should turn it over. <laughs> 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 I mean, this is an experiment who knows. Um, you know, the other thing is that someone will, will, undoubtedly take the recording digitize it and you know put it up on youtube oh yeah it's going up on youtube like yeah, it's, it's like if it's it, going to exist it's going to probably end up on youtube of somehow. course of course i i know it's just a, a five minute head start um but but it's you know it's my gesture towards a, an understanding of music that i have that that I'd, I'd like to share with people okay so let's say i wanted to get one of your 1000 albums where do i how do i get it Oh, you'd have to you have to give me a call or <laughs> <laughs> so email. so like I like I mail you a letter. Hey Lenny, yeah, or an email. <laughs> can, you, can you please give me one of these albums? Yeah, and yeah, you yeah, may yeah. or may yeah. not mail it back to me. Yeah, no, I'd mail it back. Yeah. <laughs> we 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 we'd work something out. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I like I really I don't know, I really think that's so so interesting. Like what kind of advice, especially in our very confusing time of streaming music and the industry shifting and everything? What kind of advice would you give for musicians starting out now? Double major. <laughs> <laughs> like music and computer engineering? Yes. <laughs> yeah, my my, my stand, standard advice for my students is if you can live without this, do so. You know, it's it's really, really tough. Um, the, the business has never been more difficult. Breaking into it is very, very hard. It was much easier when I was coming up. There were you know, fewer competitors and, and the venues were more obvious. Now, I mean, just imagine trying to, you know, you're, you're going to use the internet to promote yourself. Who else is using the internet to promote themselves? <laughs> you know, everybody. <laughs> like, how do you make it stand out? You know, like, what do you do? Uh, and the, you know, the $50 jazz gig that I started doing when I first moved to New York City in 1981 is still a $50 jazz gig. You mean the rates don't uh, rise rate, proportionate rate to changed. inflation? No, no, rate hasn't <laughs> changed. I, I was paying $200 a month rent in the Tribeca loft when I moved to Manhattan. 
So that's just four four jazz cakes, four, four jazz, jazz cakes, cakes, and you're done. Like, like you're done like now. Now, like you know, a, a Tribeca loft in Manhattan is unapproachable by you know anybody other than you know somebody who got in early or or thousands you know, of dollars a month, and it's still fifty dollars for that jazz exactly. cake. <laughs> I I was on in the unfortunate situation of being a ninth grade dropout and being completely addicted to music and unable to you know, function any other way. I was one of those people where if you said, well, if you, you know, have a choice, what would you do? And I said, well, I don't really have a choice. Um, so you so I, really think you could have not played music. It was impossible. If I didn't play music, I, I don't, I don't think I'd still be here. So you wouldn't have been working on getting that, you know, developer job. <laughs> yeah, I would have been, I would have, I would have just fallen off the edge. Um, that was not, you know, not part of my makeup. You know, I was hell bent on it. I, I practiced, you know, six or eight hours every single day for my whole teenage life, you know, and, and until Tower Power drafted me. And, um, you know, when I was 18, um, I, I, you know, I worked very hard at my craft for many years and I continued to practice every day. It's, it's always, you know, it's all, I'm always developing it, always working on it. You know, it's my life's effort. And, you know, I do it if I wasn't employed anywhere, I'd, I'd still do the music because I, I have to, you know, my career is sort of a, you know, misrepresentation of what the possibilities are. I got extremely lucky and, and was in the right place at the right time many times over and over again. And, but that doesn't happen for everybody. And well, I'm, I'm happy that you got so lucky. I think well, I'm, this, happy. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy you got so lucky. Uh, this, I mean, this was like it was really, it was really great to talk to you today. I'm looking forward to maybe one day just pirating your record <laughs> off of YouTube. Uh, well, I do have a website. Um, it's a very strange website. Um, it's LennyPicketMusic.com, and it's a little bit of a video game with music playback. There's floating uh, orbs on the screen, and you have to hit it with your cursor. And if you're able to make contact with one of the moving orbs, uh, a song will play. And there's a hundred and something songs all together up there that are all my music. So, yeah, I guess that's the best place to check out your work. Go click on some floating orbs. It's going to it's going to confuse people. Um, that's good. People that's should fine. be confused. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show. This was so much fun. Well, thanks for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Holy shit, we're approaching the end of the year already? Before we crack open 2018, we have one quick question for you. Which episode of Weird Work has been your favorite so far? Send us some holiday cheer by letting us know at hello at weirdworkpodcast.com or shoot us a message on Facebook or Twitter at Weird Work. Let us know which episodes you dug the most, and we'll see you next week. Okay, thanks. Bye. Hi. Hi.